let's start this session. The program says I have two, three minutes. I would rather take one minute and then take other two minutes at the end of the day when I have the opportunity to summarize. Uh, please remember this is a draft strategy document or draft policy document. It's for the government to finalize it and government to adopt it. From civil society, all you can do is help the government push in certain direction. Two issues on which I am personally concerned. One, government of Bangladesh has lots of good policies, excellent policies, excellent strategies, but we never implement them. So maybe our efforts should continue once we are able to get this policy adopted by the government and approved by the necessary high ups in the government, maybe the parliament or maybe the high level committee on disaster management chaired by the prime minister herself. And then we like to uh, see that the provisions of these are faithfully implemented. Climate change is in infancy. If people are looking for climate change, displaced people, I'm sorry, they may not exist as of today. As of today, the global temperature has gone up by one degree. The 2018 October report suggested it has a range of 0.8 to 1.2 in various parts of the world. So average is one degree. It may go up to 1.5 by 2030 to 3 degrees, 4 degrees by end of the century. The world has promised that the temperature would be controlled well below 2 degrees. Gentlemen, ladies, I am deeply involved in this negotiation. I know it is not going to happen. The IPCC 6 report that is due in 2023. Now the global community, the world community is pushing its early delivery. Possibly the technical report should be out by 2021. Maybe the final report by 2022. We have the opportunity to go through the draft, which is now being critically reviewed, indicate that the temperature will be 3.86 degrees. After 3.86 degrees, maybe the world will be able to push it back to 2 degrees and then further lower 1.5. By that time, damage would be done. And possibly you know that the goal of the Paris Agreement is to ensure food security for the world. There is only one global agenda today in front of the world, which is food security. And if there is food insecurity, obviously, that results into migration or displacement or movement of people from one area to other, other areas. And then there are issues related to livelihood and health and other things. Please remember, under Paris Agreement, these are secondary issues. The main issue is food security. Having said that, while I, I listen to all these political leaders, and they are still confused, they do not understand the clear scenario. The way I draw the scenario is one, two, four, six. One degree has happened. We promised to, will have, to, to control it within two degrees. Six is might happen if business as usual goes on. Four will happen despite all promises. And then possibly we'll be able to lower down. If it exceeds three degree or four degree, I will not be alive. The younger people in this room will definitely be alive to see that. Maybe by the end of the century, another 70, 80 years when the whole climatic situation would be totally changed. It is raining today in Ukraine, like in Ashar. So this rainfall, as it happened over the last seven, ten days, reminds me of the monsoon rain, which is due in from middle of June to middle of August, not in first of October. So this is happening, and therefore, I would like to congratulate the teams, the civil society organization who have taken this initiative with support of British Council and DFI to prepare this policy document. I'm sure the government will find it very useful and they will make use of it. With this, let me invite the first speaker 
of this session, which is Dr. Matthew Scott, who will talk about review of disaster and climate related policies and law. Great. Uh, so, once again, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. What I will do is open this uh, session by talking about the 10 country study that the Raoul Wallenberg Institute has been coordinating in partnership with academics uh, at universities in 10 countries in Asia and the Pacific. Those countries are China, Cambodia, uh, Thailand, Myanmar, the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, Vanuatu, and the Solomon Islands. Um, we're very pleased to have here today uh, colleagues from Independent University Bangladesh, uh, the partner of Bangladesh, uh, Ateneo University uh, in uh, the Philippines, and Gajamada University in Indonesia. Uh, so you'll get an insight into the kind of work that we've been doing and some of the similarities and differences uh, between the countries. Uh, my job, uh, next slide I think. Uh, I'm not even going to tell you who, what, who we are because we did that this morning. We'll go straight into the research question and uh, talk about uh, the three outputs, which uh, many of you will already have seen. So next slide, please. Uh, the research, uh, I've introduced the countries. Now you can see the faces behind the countries. These are the research members of the research team. Uh, some of them you can see here in front of you today. So let's go to the topic. Next slide, please. Uh, so without reading it out, the, the, the job that we've been doing for the last two years has been trying to understand the role of law and policy in addressing displacement uh, in specific contexts. Uh, so in order to do that, we've heard, first had to understand what uh, international standards exist relating to displacement in the context of disasters and climate change. That's because from the start of the study, we've adopted a human rights-based approach to disasters and uh, displacement in that context. Guided, of course, as I said this morning, by directives from the Sendai Framework, from the Paris Agreement, from the Asia Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, amongst others, that encourage states and other actors to take a human rights-based approach to DRR and CCR generally, CCA generally, but also in the context of displacement, which was one of the most significant impacts of disasters. Uh, so we needed to understand what the existing international guidelines and standards were, and to do that we've produced this background brief, which many of you will have in front of you, which tries to consolidate some of the key documents, such as the guiding principles on internal displacement, the Sendai Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction, and others. What do these documents say about how states should deal with preventing displacement, protecting people during displacement, and facilitating durable solutions? And to make it a bit more user-friendly, we've consolidated 24 principles. You could easily make them 30 or 15. It's a number that comes out of the consolidation approach that was taken in this process. So um, bear with us. We could consider adding or subtracting. But what we've then done is applied those 24 key principles to the specific national law and policy contexts. And that you'll find in, for example, the one you've got in front of you is the Bangladesh Law and Policy Report, so which is both in English and, and in Bangla. Uh, and in that document, you'll find a consideration of the extent to which the Bangladesh law and policy context engages with international standards. Uh, first, how does the Bangladesh legal and policy framework already deal with the phenomenon of displacement? And to what extent does it reflect this rights-based approach already? Now, this is how we ended up uh, communicating with Professor Siddiqui and the partners in this national strategy on the management of disaster and climate-induced internal displacement because it's such a good fit for the research that we've been doing. We see very clearly in each of the stages, Bangladesh is talking about a rights-based approach to prevention, protection, and durable solutions. Now, the third element of the study is the question about implementation at the local level. And now, as we've already heard from the chair, that's a perennial problem 
it doesn't happen. And one of the key messages, uh, I've jumped through all of the slides probably already. If we can go slowly, yes, that's that one, next, that's that one, next, that's... We can, we can touch here a little just so you get a feeling for it. What we've done in that Bangladesh report is uh, extract elements, for example, from the national strategy, but also the Disaster Management Act, the Standing Orders on Displacement, uh, and, and other documents, I think there are about nine or so we considered in the Bangladesh context, to see what's there. Now, you can see at number one on prevention how important a rights-based approach is. Because if you look only at the Disaster Management Act, which is the legal document in force in the country, there's provision for forced relocation of people in exposed areas, which is permissible under international law, which is provided for in the guiding principles on internal displacement, but it needs to be nuanced by this rights-based approach, which requires a certain procedural standard, proportionality, necessity. So it's not just police coming and saying, you've got to get out right now or else, but you need to have these procedural safeguards in place so that people aren't arbitrarily displaced. And that's what you see in documents like the National Strategy this nuanced rights-based approach, which provides a sort of guidance to the relevant actors in how they deal with the phenomenon. That's just one isolated example. We also have elements of, uh, sorry, that should say protection and durable solutions. But conscious of time, I uh, recommend the report to you to have a look at. What we'll turn over uh, to in the next coming presentations is what the implementation looks like in the national context, because as we've heard, it doesn't matter how beautiful the document is if people on the ground aren't implementing it. And that's a question of capacity, so there's clearly a role for strengthening capacity at the ward level, at the upazila level, at the union level, district level, etc. But also, which we've heard many times today, the question about resources. It's one thing, and we'll hear that from some of the panelists as well, it's one thing to encourage action, it's one thing to have some uh, soft infrastructure introduced in terms of community-based DRR and uh, early warning uh, mechanisms. I'll actually end 30 seconds early. And thank you for your attention and turn over to the experts. Now it is time for uh, Dr. Abdullah Wal Khan of Independent University to talk about um, Bangladesh Law and Policy Report Displacement in the context of from Matt's discussion, I will start my presentation. He actually described the law and policy measures addressing um, disaster displacement. I will not be talking relating to legal issues, rather uh, we conducted an uh, interview uh, at the, our field site, Guy and Statistics. Based on our findings of the interview, I will be focusing on the uh, insights of the people who actually say it regarding their um, problems of displacement. And um, uh, maybe uh, as we already from the morning you discussed uh, uh, various legal issues and policy matters, so you will understand that how far those legal and policy issues are actually practically implemented. So it is the broader title of this our topic and uh, basically when we conducted the field work we particularly focused on the uh, flood because you know the flood we regularly we observe particularly in the uh, northern district. So this is are the some pictures we took during our field, uh, field trip, and uh, during the displacement, people uh, were displaced. They took temporary shelter in different places. You can next slide, and uh, you can see a picture of Clyde River, and uh, also our researchers, those who were taking interviews of, of the affected people. The nature, or the, if you see the picture of this river, you see that this kind of river, you do not able to keep water at the time of rainy season. Because this, the river, it looks is very flat, people they are walking, even cars are, um, and uh, uh, regularly they use it as a walkway. So it is no longer a river at all. But I ask the people that whether, what we see in the rainy season, they say that rainy season, this river cannot keep the extra water. From the uh, from the river and also uh, if any uh, anything happens so that uh, uh, we have some barriers relating to our neighbouring, if they open the gate, 
So then the problem of this disaster would be more problematic. So the displacement scenario we observed in the Gaibanda district that uh, when we asked the people, we found that most of the people they are disadvantaged. Disadvantaged both uh, financially and as well as physically. And uh, we, we are trying to ask uh, questions uh, that um, uh, who are the most affected? But we found that the people, those who are finally solvent, they could they could manage the flood easily <coughs> because money is many things if it's not everything. But those who are really financially weak, they have very limited capacity to address any kind of disaster, even if it is minor or it is small, whatever. And uh, if, uh, we asked them that um, how did you uh, displace during disaster and how long you stayed there. They say that uh, uh, one interview, she mentioned that um, her grandparents, he was displaced, his father was, he stayed with his father who was also displaced and it is now her turn. So you see that it is not a, like an a option that I, I change my place and uh, I keep myself safe. It is a eminent necessity. That means they don't have any options. It is their ultimate destination to be displaced. And uh, we also asked them that um, why do you really you move from uh, from your original place of living? They said that initially we we uh, take shelter in the nearest safe place. But if you don't find anything, then we go far. And in the morning, people raised that, that many people were displaced from. A, a local area to capital. The tendency is to move to capital. But if we can, if we can address them properly from the local area, then they would not move to capital because you know the capital is already overburdened with people. And uh, next slide, please. Barriers to prevention, based on fundings of um, our uh, research, we this although the point I will be focusing here, all all of you uh, know about this is nothing new, but. The people, they say that uh, what is their feeling, what is their understanding about uh, different law and policy measures. We ask that, do you know what is uh, right? Do you know what is human rights? Even it's not, you, we do not ask the questions to affected people. We ask the same questions to the local policy labor, uh, makers as well. They replied, the answer they replied that was not actually uh, our answer that what is meant as right. I don't want to say that they, they are uh, not educated to clarify that, but they don't. They say that the the right you mean theoretically, actually, it is not right to us. So that's why we are arguing rights-based approach because this approach in Bangladesh is still is not pop been popularized. So we need to to the policymakers, and they gave us a clear message that you you people every year or every time you. You are coming and interviewing us and making whatever you know, but our situation is not improving. That means they are claiming durable solution. And they said that if you have chance or option to tell our story to the policy makers, tell them that we are really in trouble. And the people, those who live in the remote area, they, are, they, they receive uh, less uh, support, less relief, and they said that we have we've been discriminated. So it is their thoughts, it's not my personal opinion. So, and also, if you see that, uh, uh, as we, through our research, we find some limitations of a legal and policy framework. Limitation here, we wanted to mean that the limitations to implement the policy measures in um, central level is easy because uh, authority, they monitor and they can track the situations. But in the remote area, no monitoring authority, and uh, sometimes the people, whether they are protected or not, it is not being heard as well. Especially people living in the Chor area, so they actually live far away from the mainland, so they suffer the most. And also, as I mentioned, that people are not fully aware about legal and policy issues, and uh, they, they also stated that uh, the capacity, we, we, we understand that being uh, one of the developing countries, we have limited capacity. But Bangladesh has uh, adopted impressive law and policy issues. Government, they have fantastic job. We appreciate. But problem is the implementation mechanism remains 
inadequate. And uh, uh, if you see the disaster management act or development policy document, they said that we have to do this, we have to do this. But how do we do this? How accountability will be ensured? And how the people's voice will be heard? These matters are frequently ignored. So um, my time is going to over. So I'll jump into the next slide. So there is some, um, some suggestion or uh, insight from the affected people. They said that. The rivers, as I mentioned, the flat river, it should be made it uh, dressing, dressing should be done regular basis. And the embankments where they took shelter in, uh, during the disaster immediately, this embankment should be made fit for their living to take shelter immediately because the shelter center, it becomes overcrowded at the time of disaster. And also durable solutions, they mentioned that based on their skills, they want employment or other opportunities because they don't want to receive every year relief and support because it's a humility for them. So only providing relief is not an option or solutions. So permanent uh, permanent solution could be done. And also one thing we we discovered that uh, community protection measures it work well. I mean that they said that at the time of dis disaster, the community people they responded first. Before coming uh, concerned authority or government or any others, they help each other. So they want that they, their voice should be heard formally. That means at the time of disaster management, these people should be taken as one of the uh, uh, authority or uh, in the management process, their participation is necessary. So with all this, I finish my presentation. If you have any questions, you can ask our team. Let me invite the uh, next speaker, Mr. Ahmed Rizki Martha Tilla, Martha Tilla Umar. He is a PhD candidate at the University of Queensland and he will be talking about reflections from Indonesia, disasters and climate change situation. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ahmed uh, Rizki Martha Tilla Umar. Uh, I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Queensland. But I'm also uh, working as a research associate as the ASEAN Study Center at the Gajah Mada University in Indonesia. So basically what I will talk uh, this afternoon will be based on uh, research I conducted in accordance to uh, RWI uh, research program uh, in Indonesia. So let me begin by highlighting uh, the most interesting fact, uh, fact of uh, disaster and climate change in Indonesia is that uh, Indonesia has some multiple hazards and uh, Indonesia is exposed to multiple vulnerabilities to disasters uh, which is related, some of them are related to the climate change with floods, with the rise of the sea level uh, and uh, the drought uh, in some parts uh, but also uh, with some others uh, are not related to the climate change like what I will be doing, uh, studying, uh, what I will be talking uh, this afternoon is about volcanic eruptions, which uh, is related to the tectonic uh, uh, conditions in Indonesia, <coughs> which place Indonesia at the center of the ring of fires. So this is the, the vulnerability that Indonesia has uh, uh, in uh, a disaster. So, uh, one thing that is important to note is that uh, because of these multiple hazards and multiple vulnerabilities, uh, we also, uh, each different region has its own challenges. Uh, so we have a very spread uh, forms of hazards and the very different ways to engage with this, with these hazards in order to uh, deal with uh, disasters. And as a consequence, uh, the forms of disaster displacement in Indonesia is also different in uh, regarding uh, its uh, types of uh, hazards. What I will be uh, discussing this afternoon is uh, based on my study on Sinabu. Can you please go to the next? Okay. So uh, since 2018, uh, I and my two other colleagues uh, are uh, doing some research in uh, Mount Sinabung in uh, North Sumatra province in uh, Indonesia. 
So if you if we take a look at the Indonesian uh, map, uh, Mount Sinabung is located in the westernmost uh, province of Indonesia, the province of uh, the province of North Sumatra, which has been erupted since 2013. Uh, recently, a couple of months ago, uh, there it was another eruptions uh, occurred uh, in the mountain. And uh, until nowadays, there are more than 10,000 people displaced uh, from, from the uh, uh, Mount Sinabu uh, area. So, uh, based on this uh, map, uh, I would like to highlight three key points that is uh, important uh, from our uh, research. The first is that uh, lessons learned from Sinabu is that local politics matters in uh, disaster uh, displacement. Uh, no matter how good the national policy framework and how good the national legal framework is in, in the national level, because of the, the very specific types of hazard, local politics will be most influential in uh, uh, determining uh, the, how better, how good is the evacuation process is. And also we have to deal with different uh, multi and multiple institutions and actors. Uh, we have a local disaster management agency, which is the, the most prominent uh, actor in, in the field. We have the military, we have uh, uh, government agencies, and so on. And consequently also, we have uh, many converging and diverging interests involved in the, disaster, in the practice of disaster displacement. Which leads to my second point, uh, that one thing that I have observed uh, in, in Sinabung is that there was a practice of independent evacuation in which the, the, the people living in the Mount Sinabung area independently evacuates when disaster alerts. So there are two forms of uh, evacuations uh, that we have observed. The first is the government-led evacuations, which is maintained through the, the legal and policy framework from the national level, and also the, the social-led uh, uh, evacuation within which uh, the, the independent uh, villagers led by the community leaders and the family members are uh, voluntarily and independently evacuated when disaster alerts. And this is inevitable in our case. So, uh, we think that we need uh, a durable solution uh, to, to uh, address these issues. Because uh, in, in our case, people are returning to their houses amid disaster vulnerabilities due to social and economic reasons. And this is important, therefore, to, to uh, have uh, a, a better uh, and a durable solutions uh, to address the social and economic vulnerabilities resulting from the uh, displacement and uh, disaster context. Next. So uh, we have two lessons learned uh, for, uh, the, to protect the persons with disabilities. We have also showed that the people with this, the persons with disabilities are the most exposed persons uh, during disaster displacement. Uh, so during the disaster, especially with the independent evacuation process, the uh, sometimes the persons with disabilities are not properly addressed uh, in terms of the fulfillment of needs because the protection is provided by the family members and the community leaders. So we have uh, to address and the government needs to ensure that the protection and prioritization of needs are important, uh, addressed in this case. The second is, uh, we also need a government's coordinated efforts in all levels. We need to integrate the national and subnational level governance in dealing with, with disaster and displacements, as well as involving family and community members uh, with the government report in, in order to ensure the protection and the prioritization of needs of the persons with disabilities are fulfilled. So this is, I think, uh, two things that uh, uh, we could share with, uh, with the Bangladesh experience. I think Bangladesh experience has uh, a different but comforting uh, uh, patterns. Uh, and this is why I, I think I was happy to learn with the Bangladeshi context in, in protecting uh, persons with disabilities in, in Asia and Pacific. Thank you very much. I move to a little bit farther away from Dhaka. Let's go to 
Philippines, and we'll have the reflections from Philippines on disaster and climate change situation. This will be presented by Ryan Jemaria Cohen. He is a professor of law in an university in Philippines. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ryan. As was mentioned, um, I teach um, law at the Ateneo de Manila University in the Philippines, and I am part of this research team that was convened by the Royal Vandenberg Institute. Um, let me uh, so maybe uh, let me give you a bit of a context. Can we click the next? So the Philippines is a uh, uh, just like Indonesia. We we experience a lot of disasters every year. We average around 20 typhoons every year. Um, that's an average. Uh, please go back. Um, back. There. We average around 20 typhoons every year. We have volcanic eruptions. We are part of the Pacific Ring of Fire that was mentioned by Bumar earlier. Um, we, this constant exposure, I think, leads the people to be more vulnerable. Next, please. Um, resilience is a very is, is ha very high among Filipinos, and I, I'm sure it's the same with uh, a lot of the people here in Bangladesh as well. Um, the problem with this is that we are used to disasters, particularly typhoons, but the climate change is the game changer. The severe weather events, uh, the information that's on severe weather events, this becomes beco uh, becomes very cr critical. The normalization of threat because of the constant um, exposure to adverse effects of climate change related events and severe weather events render the people more vulnerable. So for the purposes of this study, what I uh, looked at was the um, uh, super typhoon Haiyan or Yolanda, locally known as Yolanda in the Philippines. This happened in 2013. Um, just a bit of uh, some fast facts. It was equivalent to a category five cyclone, um, 195 miles per hour, um, affected public populations, more than three million, almost 3.5 million families, casualties, more than 6,000 reported dead, a lot injured. Total damage was estimated at around 1.6 billion US dollars. So that's a bit of a fast facts for for the for for the super typhoon, and then. Around 14.4 million people were displaced. This was um, uh, the one documented by the United Nations. And then, uh, next please. For emergency shelter, there were um, uh, one, uh, more than one million people, uh, more than one million houses affected, which contributed to the displacement. Now, in the Philippines, when we talk about um, displacement, let me make, make mention that we are usually talking about evacuation. Okay. Next, please. So the study site. Um, I what? Uh, next, please. We I looked at the municipality of Dulag. It's one. The municipality means one of the local government units. It's right there, facing the Pacific Ocean. So um, it's very vulnerable to to typhoons. Um, of the twenty, I would hazard a, an educated guess that more than ten of those would hit this area. Um, it's a next, please. It's a coastal town uh, with a population next to the population of more than 50,000 uh, as of 2017 next. And it has nine coastal barangays. Barangays is the smallest, the barangay is the smallest local government unit in the Philippines. What I will uh, focus on for, for this purpose is really the, next please, uh, is, the, is the evacuation and protection during the time of displacement. As, because as I mentioned, when we speak of displacement in the Philippines, we usually pertain to evacuation. After the evacuation, people normally go back, and the disaster is gone, um, the, the people go back to their uh, houses. Um, I think uh, I, I will make mention of three key points. The first key point is that the sheer strength of the typhoon became the biggest problem in the Philippines, in the, in the, in the municipality, I mean. Um, it led to the collapse of local response mechanisms because of this strength. It affected a lot of things because um, the, uh, the first responders, um, health resp uh, people from the rural health unit, uh, people who were supposed to distribute relief goods, were also victims themselves. So it kind of affected. It really affected the way they would respond to their usual uh, uh, to, to the disasters that they usually face. Um, there was also health-related concerns because there was an outbreak of mosquito-borne diseases. Second main point I'd like to highlight is the limited implementation 
of international and national laws uh, at the local government level. For it, to I give two examples, one of them would be the generic um, spaces for displaced persons, meaning the um, evacuation areas did not have women and child-friendly spaces, even if these were required by the Magna Carta of Women in the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act. And we have also a children, Children's Emergency and Protection, Relief and Protection Act. So these are all required by law, but were not, uh, but were not followed. Typically, classrooms and school buildings, can go back. Um, classrooms and school buildings are used as evacuation centers. Um, sometimes the, dis uh, the evacuation is prolonged, hampering the operation of school, uh, hampering the operations of school. So this affects also the right to education of children. And then um, the third point I'd like to make is uh, uh, there are difficulties in implementing international, na international and national standards. Some of the local government officials we interviewed so, somehow mentioned that, yeah, we know that these standards exist, but because of resource constraints and limited personnel, we have problems implementing these. Of course, this should not be used as an excuse. Um, there's, um, following a human rights-based approach, we follow the principle of progressive realization and the max, uh, following the maximum, the min with minimum core obligations. So, but these are re real constraints at the ground level. Next, please. Um, that said, displacement. Oh, displa displacement affects human rights, and I'd like to highlight uh, a few points that both state and non-state actors did play a role in responding to these um, uh, to these uh, to this disaster. Uh, for, and it's very typical in the Philippine context that the NGOs are really present. But as was mentioned by the by our chair earlier, it should be the job of the, the government and the NGOs are just there to support. So these are the the some of the uh, re responses that were given. Next, please. Um, in this key point, I'd like to highlight that uh, next next please that there are uh, what I call public private public partnership. The government, the local government, has since adopted an, a, a, this adopt a family program. They contract, they signed a contract with uh, the houses that were made of stone, so that they could accommodate those who will be displaced later on. Next, um, and some lessons in probably ways forward. Um, three main points. Next, please. The, the first is the importance of adopting a human rights-based approach in DRRM. This gives focus to marginalized groups and. Um, and highlights the obligations and accountability versus, of states versus the reliance on NGO support. Uh, there's also a need to give priority to DRRM, especially in terms of uh, resource allocation. And finally, local level implementation is very important. The local government, the local governments are more in touch with their con constituencies, and I always say this: that local solutions for local problems. This is a very, this is very important. And as a final note, I think that resilience of people should not be made as a convenient excuse for states to escape their, 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 their obligation. Their resilience is a good trait, but this should, this should, this should not be made as, a, as an excuse to, to not comply with international human rights obligations. And with that, thank you very much.